So hello everybody, welcome to season two of our Spotlight series. Um, so today I have Dana with me, who is a Nottingham GEM student. Hi Dana. Hi, hello. Hi. Thank you so much for giving your time today. Um, really excited to hear about your story. Um, so let's just get straight stuck in. So um, tell me about yourself. What did you do before you started medicine? Okay, so medicine was a decision uh, which was taken really gradually. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was 17 years old, 18 years old, back in Italy, which is my country of origin, I I had the feeling that I wanted to do medicine, um, but I didn't have the confidence um, about doing medicine. And uh, not because of the grades, but it was more because of social circumstances. So it didn't come from the typical um, upper middle class family. So coming from a working class family, um, having had financial difficulties and the kind of um, poverty that you experience in developed countries. Uh, I thought that there was something about me that didn't make me the perfect personality or candidate for medicine. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I decided to start doing studying politics uh, because there was this okay. idea of changing the world. Um, so I started really, mm -hmm. really, really high ideas about changing the world. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, with politics uh, and I studied politics in the UK um, at the LSE. And then after that, I... Uh, did a master a still in political theory and I was offered a PhD in Princeton University and then a postdoctoral research associate position in Princeton mm -hmm. uh, still in um, more philosophy political theory mm -hmm. uh, with some issues uh, linked to bioethics because the professor I work with when I was in Princeton it was mostly a bioethicist mm -hmm. and and so working with them in bioethics mm -hmm. um, I think it made me think back about the original passion I had um, getting into medicine. And then something happened in my life which wasn't extremely positive. Um, it was more of a negative or some people say tragic circumstance. And, and sometimes when you have those big life events, you start thinking about what you didn't do in the past mm -hmm. <laughs> and what mm -hmm. you would like to have done. And I, I took the positive uh, side of that non-positive event and mm -hmm. I said okay I'm in my mid-30s I'm mm -hmm. not young as I should have been for medicine I don't know but I can see I want to try it I want at least to give it a go mm -hmm. and I came to know that there was a graduate entry medicine program because on my mother's side my mother being English I had um, so I knew uh, something about um, uh, graduate entry medicine courses. Um, and then I said, um, OK, let's let's try. It's been a long process because coming from the humanities, I needed to do the A-levels. Um, mm -hmm. So in my mid-30s, I went to Nottingham College to study A-levels. And, and, and so it's been kind of a long journey. But yeah, I yeah. am. So that was my background uh, before. So from being postdoctoral research associate and uh, assistant yeah. professor to going back to being a student <laughs> mm -hmm. that is yeah quite a quite a jump across um and especially from the humanities as well to um I suppose medicine incorporates a huge amount of humanities um so you can bring it sounds like you can bring quite a lot of uh what you've been working on before to medicine mm -hmm. yeah yeah how was it going to college before even studying medicine um, you mean to Nottingham College to study yeah. levels? Or, yeah. Uh, it was really scary at the beginning. Okay. I, <laughs> uh, because I could have been the mother <laughs> since I'm 16 or 17 yeah. years old. Mm -hmm. and, but I was quite surprised about uh, the welcoming they gave me. And it was mm -hmm. like being a big sister or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and then they embraced the fact they had more experience and... Uh, um, for me, it was, it was different. Uh, it was really hard to understand the new way of studying because my uh, the equivalent of A-levels I done was in Italy. And so the, um, mm -hmm. the way of studying was really different. Um, so the A-level system in Italy is totally, it doesn't exist as A-level as such, but it's really, really different. 
Um, so after so many years with a mindset for the PhD, which is a different studying for A-levels, mm. at the beginning it was quite hard. So some Ds and some Ds and Es <laughs> were mm-hmm. coming, especially in chemistry. But then I picked, I picked up and then I ended up with, um, with a star in chemistry and yeah. uh, um, so a, in maths and um, in mm. biology as well. So I managed that, but at the beginning it was it was really different. Uh, you felt a little bit out of place in many different ways, and it was also the lack of authority because from having your own office and your research funding mm-hmm. and uh, a secretary helping you, and then you go back into this Nottingham College with 16, 17 years old who could have been your children, and then you study. But medicine, the will to do medicine, it was so strong. <laughs> Yeah, that I read, uh, it, it was tough at times because it said um, my preferred name is Dana so usually people call me Dana so then I tell mm-hmm. it's, it's more on papers and so that was the name my mom used to call me and mm-hmm. uh, and then I said Dana what have you done <laughs> yeah. uh, what have you done to yourself uh, but then it, in the end it was when I got the results and uh, after the good results I got the first offers in um, the first offer the first offer for an interview mm-hmm. and then um, offer for medicine I think it was it been a price worth paying <laughs> yeah and I think it's it could be quite important for other people to hear you know you've studied at a high level you've achieved you know a really high academic stature in your field yet you know, going to A-levels, the transition can still be hard. And although um, you brought a lot of different skills, you can't expect to necessarily transition and immediately Mm -hmm. be really successful still. And I think it was quite disheartening, I think, because you almost feel like you've spent so long working up your respective field, making all the mistakes, learning, and then to feel like, you know, you've come back down again and it's you're facing challenges um must take a lot of resilience to be like you know nope I'll get there I can I'll <laughs> keep going hmm. yeah I'm quite I'm quite stubborn I have a fantastic support network yeah because uh, my mum unfortunately is no longer with us uh, mm-hmm. and that is the, not the positive event I was yeah, referring okay. to uh, but my dad uh, has been a really strong supporter of my mm-hmm. crazy adventure <laughs> Yeah. And uh, it was always the one telling me, so just to keep up the goal is something that I remember you wanted mm-hmm. to do even from an early stage, from an early age. And nobody in my family had medical experience as well. So mm-hmm. um, so my, my dad was a postman, so <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> as nothing. And, um, and my mum was usually teaching English in uh, back in Italy, but okay. so they didn't have any kind of medical a background or anything mm-hmm. like that but you could see my dad could see the passion I had for it um and it's been incredibly supportive so it was a, it was a shoulder to cry on but also positive force for that and then I um, I had my partner as well um as another really positive force is as an academic and faculty of engineering and um so it always, it always believed in me and uh, mm-hmm. uh, it supported me financially because obviously there are financial implications for that uh, mm-hmm. because from being the academic uh, to study for GAMSAT and relevant exams yeah. and then to study for day levels I was doing mostly tutoring and then working as an HTA to get some work experience in medicine and mm-hmm. again is another knock to your kind of to your confidence and to your sense of yeah. authority because from being mm-hmm. a professor you are an HCA so and uh, nothing wrong with being, with being an HCA yeah. but for me personally it, it's something that you need to take into account uh, because it's a, it's a big sacrifice that you're making to, to start your new career and your new life mm-hmm. and at, at times it's been tough at times especially mm-hmm. waiting for <laughs> the offer to came and the interviews the mm-hmm. outcome of interviews it was always at the back of your mind. What if I've done? What if I'm not successful? What do I do? Do I have a plan B? Um, yeah. What is the plan B? So, um, but in the end, it paid off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's quite a lot of changes all in one go, you know, leaving your position, starting the A-levels, starting HCA work, you know, academic changes, changes to, you know, part-time work. Uh, that must have been, yeah, a lot to take on. Did you have any medical kind of experience at all before the HEA shifts? Um, I 
had um, mostly in Italy. I've done mm -hmm. some some work, uh, but it was um, more with um, kind of charities or with the church where we are mm -hmm. helping homeless, and so we were given some basic medical care, but nothing within within an NHS or formal NHS, and mm -hmm. uh, um, and also had some um condition myself and mm -hmm. uh, um so I've, I've learned to understand about medicine because of my yeah. my own condition chronic kidney condition which is something mm -hmm. that i'm carrying and carrying on and some um some problems with depression as well mm -hmm. and post-traumatic stress disorder so those elements are well need well are needed mm -hmm. um most constant care for chronic conditions in physical and mental health so they're mm -hmm. They've taught me a little bit about about medications and about mm -hmm. the treatment and pathways and <laughs> yeah, dealing with GPs, dealing with secondary yeah. care, so all those kind. Yeah, but as the direct, direct experience, it was being an HCA in England, um, mm -hmm. understanding the NHS and yeah. And from your experience as being a patient, was it what you expected then when you started at? being an HEA so did you kind of did it line up with what you're expecting as medical experience um yeah the NHS is really complex mm -hmm. in its positives and in its negatives I think I didn't realize how much um you become almost addicted um to the uh, to the family of the NHS that's something that I discounted so even mm -hmm. if an HCA so your ward and the colleagues you work with even though you mm -hmm. have your differences or you, you, you build up families <laughs> and it becomes a really mm -hmm. your family and um, despite some of the shortcomings where the financial structure or whatever in the mm -hmm. NHS uh, what you're going you, what you always have is that kind of sense of, of family and mm -hmm. and you pull through and there is this, this mutual support which is something I didn't expect to that extent um, okay. I, I was more like yeah probably you do your job and you find nice people but that's it I did I didn't expect that kind of, compared to academia which is more kind of individualistic so you, you mm -hmm. do your research you do yeah you meet your colleagues but there wasn't that kind of sense of of family of involvement of <laughs> camaraderie that you found in, in, in the hospital and uh, in that in that kind of way so that it was um, in the positive in the negative mm -hmm. I realized our, our difficulties to balance the demands um, mm -hmm. of the um, of a population who's aging mm -hmm. with the limited resources we have so when you work in the NHS and you see with your eyes you understand how difficult it is uh, to to make that that balance and that's something as a patient you don't understand that much because you mm -hmm. get really frustrated you don't get your appointment when you would mm -hmm. like to you don't get the test when you will let you when you go on the other side you understand the reason why that happens and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and probably given the circumstances I've become more much more understanding and much more patient as a patient mm -hmm. <laughs> about my waiting because I've seen that it's not done on purpose, it's done because that kind of weight uh, is the best that the NHS can do at the moment with the resources and with the demand that's imposed upon the NHS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think often if you've just maybe had only a little bit of experience beforehand going into um, you know, a medicine application with, you know, that hands-on experience as an HEA is, is really important um, because it's, you say, even as a patient, you know, you've interacted with the healthcare system and you still don't really quite appreciate, um, well, one, the pressures, but two, just how amazing being part of the team can be. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So thinking about the application um, in general then, so you had some experience um, as an HEA. Did you say, you mentioned the GAMSAT as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I tried the UCAT, but okay. the UC I tried. I, I didn't even try because I didn't sit it. But I tried to prepare for the UCAT, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't find it was the test for me. Mm -hmm. um, I I was really slow when I was trying with Medify. The kind of scores mm -hmm. I was getting, they mm -hmm. were really far away from even the average ones. And um, so I was quite realistic at the beginning. I was a little bit upset. I said, mm -hmm. "No, this is not going to work." But I was quite realistic, and so I said, "Let's try." to see if other tests suit me better 
Um, and GAMSAT uh, is a hard test, but I think especially coming from a PhD background, um, so it's more academic in the sense that you, you need to study more. There is critical reasoning, critical thinking, lateral thinking. And, um, and I think with my kind of philosophical expertise, uh, some of the lateral thinking that you have acquired in your previous knowledge as a philosopher, uh, you can apply to the uh, to the Gamsat reasoning, and it wasn't much about science and knowing science per se, but mm -hmm. reasoning uh, on the stem that you had in front of you. And as I said, if you developed this lateral thinking, like I had in my previous career, I found Gamsat much uh, for me easier easier mm -hmm. compared to to UCAT. Um, mm -hmm. So I did I did Gamsat, and then. I sat the uh, situational judgment test yeah. only for the UCAT, which was a requirement for Scott Gem, which was mm -hmm. a university I was interested. Um, it was St. Andrews and it was a university I was interested in applying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did um, I did those two, those two tests because the university I wanted to apply to, they required um, GAMSAT and then uh, GAMSAT plus this extra situational judgment test uh, for mm -hmm. St. Andrews. And then the other university I applied to was Cambridge, but they didn't require any specific tests. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it was my A-levels, which are already end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's, uh, again, another important thing where it's okay to say if a test is not for you, it's obviously a little challenging because there's only a few tests, there's, you know, the UCAT, BMAT and GAMSAT, Mm -hmm. for most of the universities so if one of the tests isn't for you that does I suppose limit your choices um, but they are very different and they suit very different styles of thinking um, so it's definitely good to have a look into them understand what they entail um, and then make strategic applications based on where you think your strengths are yeah so is that what when you decided that the GAMSAT was the exam for you is that what you based where you chose the universities on um, for applying? Yeah, yeah, that was when I saw the GAMSAT was for me. I said, OK, let's have a look mm -hmm. at what universities require GAMSAT. And then I saw, and I was quite lucky because there was a match with the university already liked even mm -hmm. before <laughs> yeah. I, I, I see the GAMSAT was, um, was a, a good choice. Probably the only university I had a look upon and I went to the open day and I quite like it was Warwick and mm -hmm. Warwick at the UCAT and that was the only university I decided, okay, I really like Warwick, but I think I won't be competitive mm -hmm. enough for, for an application you know, given my UCAT. And so that was, um, mm -hmm. I think I decided to change Swansea uh, Warwick with Swansea because Swansea um, required the, um, the um, mm -hmm. GAMSAT because yeah, Nottingham University was a university I was interested in because mm -hmm. my partner worked at the University of Nottingham so okay. it was a place where I already lived and so I said yeah that is is a potential option mm -hmm. and um, and and Scott Jam because I when I uh, during my PhD studies, I had a um, really good experience at St. Andrew University, and I remember okay. how good the system, how supportive the system was. I totally loved uh, Dundee and St. Andrews and mm -hmm. the area in Scotland, so that was a place I could feel myself at ease. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I look at the program they had, it sounds quite a, a nice program where they had mm -hmm. a specific focus on technology and new research, and mm -hmm. so that was um, an area I was quite interested um, on and so I said it could be my choice and then the other two choices was more like um, every university I was interested in they weren't mm -hmm. my particular choice and uh, yeah it was um, at Cambridge I was interested in more because of the because uh, um, of my PhD and coming mm -hmm. from um, from Princeton I said probably they have more of an academic mm -hmm. um, but I, I did know that I didn't have much of a chance but if you don't try <laughs> Yeah. So you, yeah. you you cannot you cannot know and and then uh, the other one was Wanzi. Yeah. yeah, I mean you've got you know coming from a, a PhD and um, you know research associate, you've got to have as good a chance as anyone else um, you'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more that I think when it comes to the interview, uh, I think the kind of they have is really limited in Cambridge Gem, so you have twenty two. Okay. only 22 okay. students um mm -hmm. so um, and they have really competitive students there so mm -hmm. uh, and even if you have really good students like I was or with really, really in, impressive background but mm -hmm. to find 
more than 22 people with NFT is easy. To find mm -hmm. less than them is, yeah, is not that easy. So in the end, I, I think, but I still, I'm, I still I like the fact they tried. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, so then uh, you're at Nottingham. How, how has that been? Um, I got two offers. Originally, it was from okay. St Andrews and from Nottingham. And, okay. and so until the very last minute, it was, yeah, where do I do? Nottingham, mm -hmm. where do I do? St Andrews. And, uh, um, and then in the end, it was, um, it was when I went to Nottingham, the open day, before going to Nottingham, the open day made a big difference <laughs> to me. Okay. Okay. Um, I found the university really, and the GEM course is really diverse in terms of nationalities and in terms of age mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Compared to other university I've seen, uh, they had more people in the late 30s or mm -hmm. early 40s in Nottingham compared to the other university I've seen. Um, I could see academics were really passionate. I, mm -hmm. I also um, think that they had a really good um, explanation of the AWF support that was okay. going to be in place for the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And given my complex physical and uh, emotional mm -hmm. situation is something that I needed to have in place mm -hmm. uh, from the very start. And it seemed to be the, uh, the university was playing that better compared to, <laughs> to other universities. It's not that the university mm -hmm. didn't have that in place, but it wasn't explained that clearly starting from the open day with all that focus and uh, on that. So those were the two the two main reasons um, decided me to, and then uh, more a family reason because mm -hmm. I already lived there, so I knew Nottingham, so I didn't have to find a place to live. I didn't, um, so that would have been another, another massive plus. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think um, in terms of course diversity, having a, a course that takes humanities backgrounds and science backgrounds for graduate entry, um, that must create yeah a diverse pool of students to work with yeah and uh and since i started i've been i've been really happy so mm -hmm. in terms of uh the uh, work for support i couldn't um expect any better mm -hmm. from what i've seen for what experience has been really top-notch really um outstanding mm -hmm. um personal tutor and um any work for support when you have your wobbles or when you you need some a little bit of extra time if you need it or but really present really approachable always always there for you um in terms of the teaching i found the teaching high quality um mm -hmm. especially i think um probably people coming from the biomedical sciences uh they had different opinions okay. but to me the fact that they were going to explain from the very basics um so they were giving us not coming from that background uh, the same opportunity to to develop knowledge to the same level of person of biomedical background probably a person from biomedical background or science background you would have found would have found some of the lectures quite boring because they were repeating mm -hmm. what they already knew but for us so for people like me that was really important so there was that intention of keeping us at the same level of knowledge and investing on that which I which I appreciated um mm -hmm. So that was that was a really so I got really interested in pharmacology I, okay. <laughs> which yeah. is really far away from um so chemistry even at levels was one of the subjects I, I liked the mm -hmm. most and then I transferred this this love of organic chemistry that I know is quite bizarre um mm -hmm. into into pharmacology um but also I think I found links between pharmacology and philosophy not in the content obviously but in the mm -hmm. way you're thinking so the mechanism of action okay. and the pathways there is that kind of um, logical thinking and connecting okay. this pattern this pathway which is kind of philosophical in nature and this is what I liked uh, quite a lot and so I have this passion for pharmacology and sometimes even now in study groups I'm, I'm the lead um, yeah. in study groups of pharmacology yeah. despite having no background in chemistry or mm -hmm. pharmacology mm -hmm. it's, it's something that I quite I quite enjoy I quite enjoy doing uh, the part to struggle a little bit um, more with mm -hmm. it was uh, anatomy I can uh, yeah very much relate to that struggle <laughs> because it was the first time I was in a lab <laughs> coming mm -hmm. from the US I've never been I've, I've been in A-levels uh, for the chemistry lab and biology but 
not in a, an anatomy lab, so I had no mm-hmm. idea to me the difference between dissection, cross-section. It was pretty much all the same thing, mm-hmm. and um, and I, it was it was really hard to. <laughs> Uh, it's really hard to memorize, and, but it's not mm-hmm. much memorizing. It's to understand, to keep, to keep, to have the memory retention, mm-hmm. and um, and I felt quite, yeah, I found it really, really hard to. Chew. It's, it's still the hardest part of medicine, even in my second year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can uh, wholeheartedly agree on that part for anatomy. And how was your teaching affected over the last year? Did you still get to go in? Like and have in-person teaching very much. Uh, yeah, last year it was it was my first year, and so it's been kind of heavily affected. Mm-hmm. Um, so the clinical skill team they did a really good job um, in trying to maintain the face-to-face um, clinical skills, even though there were many restrictions um, in the way the clinical skills were done. Um, mm-hmm. So we could not interact with real patients. Uh, we could not interact on each other. So we were using mannequins um, all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, for example, remember the ENT uh, mm-hmm. clinical skills, it was completely changed because it was considered really risky to do an ENT, yeah. even on your colleagues. Um, uh, there were many virtual <laughs> virtual sessions with mm-hmm. your I prepare for my clinical skill for my OSCE using using um, toys, using yeah. <laughs> um, using mm-hmm. my pillow, using and mm-hmm. and that didn't feel that real um, because obviously yeah, even when you were listening to breath sounds or you needed to to listen to heart sounds, mm-hmm. it wasn't uh, that uh, that possible. So. Uh, the clinical skills were affected, even though it was the only mm-hmm. um, kind of uh, face-to-face that was preserved. We had some anatomy workshop, uh, but not many, nor as many as it used to have in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I think, felt uh, different as well, because I, I understand the anatomy is better learned when you when you go there and you Mm -hmm. start seeing the specimen and you reason on that instead of just sending everything virtual virtual from pictures on Mm -hmm. textbook um the lectures were all um asynchronous um so Mm -hmm. given um online recorded and then you could have Mm -hmm. um listened to them in your time to be honest in my case i didn't see much of a difference uh because Coming from a PhD, you organize your time quite well. So I didn't, mm-hmm. um, probably if I was a student in first experience, mm-hmm. I would have loved to have face-to-face lectures. Mm-hmm. But because I already had those, I, I was myself on the other side. So I didn't find much of a difference in using um, the, uh, the recorded lectures and mm-hmm. going to the videos than going in person. But I understand that for for young people and just some people for some people just it works better because they don't have enough attention span or whatever mm-hmm. so it works better when they're in a room for me that wasn't wasn't a big deal the pbl because they will use pbl in mm-hmm. um in jam so problem-based learning i think the problem-based learning done um virtually uh mm-hmm. it was quite it was quite hard um, okay and uh, first of all, because you know the group better, if you're in the mm-hmm. same room, if you prepare to get instead of being in in your in, in your own house and talking mm-hmm. on screen, and uh, and also was the voiceover. Sometimes you talk <laughs> over mm-hmm. people, and that found a little bit a little bit more difficult. But with PBL, I knew it was going to be uh, one of my bigger difficulties. Um, mm-hmm because I'm a little bit, despite my background, I'm quite shy. I'm not a person mm-hmm. who's, uh, who intervenes quite a lot. Mm-hmm. There is also this uh, inferiority complex about the accent. Sometimes you're afraid that your accent may come across and not as clear. Um, and so there are those, those kind of issues that prevented me from, mm-hmm. <laughs> from being an active participant in the PBL, uh, even face-to-face being virtual it made things even more complicated but then I managed when I knew the group better and I mm-hmm. was more confident about the team I was working with and the facilitator now I intervene and um, mm-hmm. and I quite I'm not one of the big interventionists but yeah but still mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I do my part yeah when it's pharmacology at least you can get your, uh, <laughs> yeah, your knowledge can... out there <laughs> 
Amazing. So have you, so you said that you haven't really had patient contact yet. Uh, we have asked some uh, kind of commu for communication skills during clinical skills. We take mm -hmm. the history. Yeah. Uh, but so far, as things stand, we we didn't have any kind of physical mm -hmm. examination on a patient. Yeah. So they were okay. all on the mannequin. Even on the OSCE, the patient were present. So mm -hmm. we were interacting with the patient verbally, but the actual physical examination was on the mannequin. Okay. I'm um, just wondering how how you found that. So, you know, talking about your experience in the PBL and kind of interacting with other students, how did you find kind of speaking to patients? Um, I think in terms of communication skills, one of the positives are coming from the humanities is, mm -hmm. is that you, you're quite good at communication and uh, mm -hmm. expressing your thoughts and your ideas, articulating your thoughts and your ideas, even the most complex um, mm -hmm. in, a clear, in a clear way. Um, uh, at times, I think it was more to try to change uh, the uh, jargon as well, because the, yeah. the way a philosopher, an academic philosopher speaks is mm -hmm. different from the way a trainee doctor or medical student speaks. Mm -hmm. And so try to understand what is the better way of communicating using mm -hmm. the, uh, the right language. And, um, and also for me, still a problem of confidence. I've never been an extremely confident person. So mm -hmm. despite the PhD and everything, for many different reasons, I've never been that confident and, and especially at the beginning that lack of confidence so when I'm at OSCE during exams uh, it comes mm -hmm. across so that there is a little bit of hesitancy and mm -hmm. um, there, there is fear and the voice drops and <laughs> and, and so yeah. that can be or you, your thought is not as well structured as it should have been because anxiety mm -hmm. um, comes through and it gives you that um that kind of but I found the um the patients really patient actors because most of the time we mm -hmm. have patient actors um they're really helpful um mm -hmm. so in terms of the feedback they give you is a really good way of improving and mm -hmm. so you understand how your communication can get better and um yeah that is something that I found I found quite useful yeah perfect I think it's something um that a lot of people can also uh, resonate with in that it's you're on the spot and it, it's uh, it's hard and often you have people watching you and you're interacting with you know the patient or patient actors and um, it's very different from the academic side of things and you know looking at lectures and and you know understanding pharmacology <laughs> yeah perfect so um, outside of medicine can you tell us a bit about yourself what, what you like to do um yeah my first job was being a professional dancer so wow okay I, my okay. first paycheck came uh from being a ballet dancer um so wow. classical ballet mm -hmm. um so when i was um, 16 i was in um a company in tuscany back in tuscany mm -hmm. and um I was just, I was in the group, I wasn't a soloist. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't that good to be a soloist, but I was good enough uh, to become a professional dancer. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm no longer a professional dancer, but I still, mm -hmm. uh, I still love, enjoy it. And one of the mm -hmm. things I missed the most during lockdown was to go into the studio and have yeah. uh, classes. I still go and there's a dance studio uh, near mm -hmm. to where I live and I still go and and, and do lessons and ballet and contemporary lessons and it relaxes me um, a lot mm -hmm. um, and then also fitness classes all the classes where there is music or more kind of choreographic mm -hmm. movements is something that I love and is a really way of distressing mm -hmm. um, another passion I have is animals and yep. especially cats um, mm -hmm. So I volunteer. All the medical students they know me for being a cat yeah. fanatic, yeah. <laughs> and I I volunteer for cat shelter, and mm -hmm. I have all things uh, cat in my in my house from the stationery to sleepers and and everything, and mm -hmm. uh, it gives me sheer joy. Um, I, I love that. Yeah, I love big cats as well. So I, I do some mm -hmm. volunteering work, but yeah cats as a, as a pet and hopefully uh, we're going to move to the new house uh, where we can afford a pet and um, yeah. we'll have we'll have a pet we'll have a, a cat so I'm really excited about, about yeah. that mm -hmm. um, so other passions languages uh, mm -hmm. because I 
apart from my uh, my first language, which is Italian, and then because my dad is French and um, okay. mum English, so I speak French as well, and um, and then obviously English. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like learning languages as a way of um, learning different cultures and different mm-hmm. ways of of, of living and. Uh, it opens, it opens your mind in, in such a way that I love. And, and obviously, with the love for languages it goes the love for traveling, which now has been, <laughs> has been a yeah, little bit really detailed. But yeah, still, and now I'm, I'm trying to learn Arabic. And um, okay. um, yeah, I haven't gone that far because medicine doesn't give you much time to do <laughs> many other things. But mm-hmm. yeah, but still, it's still part of my, of my project. It's Portuguese and Arabic, yeah. The languages oh. that like you, mm-hmm. uh, to know something more about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd actually um, I see on your Instagram about cats, so I, I put this shirt on especially with the little me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. yeah I'm, I'm just I'm just terrible. Um, so and my my partner says I'm a cat magnet uh, because he notices mm-hmm. the things I moved in uh, with him and so there are much more there are many more cats coming around than before yeah. so he thinks yeah. that may be the reason why <laughs> mm-hmm. I can sense they can sense the love for yeah mm. so you have obviously a very um, rich experience coming to medicine in your hobbies and your personal kind of medical experiences has any of that shaped what you picture that you may do with your medical degree any specialities or um yeah psychiatry is one of the mm-hmm. speciality I would like to do mm-hmm. um to be honest when I decided to do medicine it was because I wanted to be a psychiatrist okay. so I want okay. to do medicine because I want to be a psychiatrist. So medicine mm-hmm. is the vehicle to get to psychiatry. Yeah. Um, and now I still love psychiatry um, mm-hmm. because I, I love it for many different reasons. It's because of my previous experience. Mm-hmm. Um, there is the kind of philosophical part, the more holistic treatment of mm-hmm. the patient, um, where communication skills and um, uh, psychological and philosophical mm-hmm. understanding, understanding the narrative, the stories of the patient. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think my humanities background is more in tune with psychiatry compared mm-hmm. to other specialties. Um, and so in that case, I would use my previous background more compared to other specialties. Mm-hmm. Um, and also because of my own lived experience, um, mm-hmm. so it's, it's a way of understanding better what's affected you and has been mm-hmm. affecting you uh, for quite for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, when you go to the other side, is is a way also controlling mm-hmm. <laughs> your own, um, your own maladaptive ways or illnesses mm-hmm. that you uh, you have developed. Um, and um, and also because I have always had medicine, for me, medicine, there is a strong vocational part, mm-hmm. vocational side for my reason to get into medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so this idea of service to others in, in a field like psychiatry is even more enhanced because probably you find the most vulnerable patients, uh, patients mm-hmm. who are, were so thought disordered, so unwell that they have no body, sometimes by the psychiatrist there or the uh, of the nurses looking after them and I like that kind of service that can give to the most vulnerable among the mm-hmm. vulnerables and um, and so that is um is kind of a reason why psychiatry could be um could be the best uh, specialty for me also I think mm-hmm. being more of a mature student psychiatry could be um probably you'll find more mature students more attracted to psychiatry compared mm-hmm. I don't want to generalize yeah. compared to the young student who wants mm-hmm. to go into this super exciting specialty yeah. where mm-hmm. they can save life and be in their kind of ER type of surgeon mm-hmm. or whatever um yeah film so doctor or casualty or <laughs> whatever mm-hmm. is um so um, I may I may maybe a wrong assumption but I I think there's yeah with maturity you can value psychiatry better than when you are young mm-hmm. and you want to stay away from that kind of complexity at times extra complexity that is given to psychiatry as a branch of as a branch of medicine mm-hmm. um and and the other specialty is GP um okay. yeah 
mostly because of, yeah, in GP, there is still a big component of mm -hmm. communication skills and also because of the continuity of care. Um, mm -hmm. I, really, I really like to see the patient through and to follow the story, the narrative of the patient from mm -hmm. uh, the start to the end, even though I know that now with the way primary care is, um, is, is a little bit more difficult um, because you have so many patients and it's, it's a little bit more difficult to follow a patient mm -hmm. through the years because they change doctors all the time and it depends on the resources of the, uh, of the, um, uh, family, of the practice or the primary care practice. But, but still, there's more continuity of care compared to an emergency department mm -hmm. doctor where you see the patient and, and you're discharging to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. the community or, um, or to other places. So I, I think um, what I won't be, I think I won't be a surgeon yeah. um, mm -hmm. because I, I'm, I'm not that good with hands on things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes when it comes to, uh, to practical things, I always made this joke that I am I'm a little bit like Mr. Bean, so I don't mm -hmm. want to end up uh, with something left in the bodies mm -hmm. <laughs> of the patient. Yeah. And and so far, I found anatomy quite yeah. quite challenging. So obviously, to be a surgeon, um, to the best of your ability, you need to be an anatomy mm -hmm. user, which I'm definitely not. So mm -hmm. that is something that probably, unless miracle miracle happens, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's still time. <laughs> there's still ability, time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I think it's, it's it's not going to be it's not going to be like. And then I think I have I don't have the personality, not in a negative way, but my personality is not the personality that I see most suitable for being a surgeon. I think my personality is more suitable for being a psychiatrist or a GP than being a mm -hmm. surgeon. It's nothing negative. It's just the way I am. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I think perhaps knowing having time to know yourself a bit better as as you get older then um that's why I always find it really interesting asking about people's ideas about uh specialties to go into because um sometimes obviously we can't generalize but sometimes people have um yeah more uh clear ideas of what specialties might suit them or what what they might uh, like to go into <laughs> perfect um so it's been amazing hearing um about your journey to medicine um, and hopefully where that journey is going to take you. Uh, just for anyone that's either applying or they've already started medicine, do you have a top tip for you know, anything you've learnt either through the application process or, or since you've been studying that you would pass on to anybody? Um, yeah, the first, the first thing is be yourself. Um, I think yeah. at the moment, there are an awful lot of, of tips and uh, advice mm -hmm. about how to prepare for the interview, how to, how to do these, the best way to do these, the best. And uh, it's important to prepare uh, because it's important to prepare for the interviews, to prepare for the test, but try to maintain your authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really important uh, during the uh, um, medical school process. They want mm -hmm. authenticity. They want to see that you like medicine because it's something mm -hmm. that really the answers you give is something that belongs to you. It doesn't belong mm -hmm. to anybody. It doesn't belong to the script that you're seeing mm -hmm. somewhere else. So those are your reasons why you get into medicine. Whether it's because you um, you want more financial stability, it could be it could be like that. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing wrong with that. Whether you have more vocation, or, but just be honest. They don't judge mm -hmm. what is the motive, uh, but they want you to be authentic and they want mm -hmm. you to be um, to be you in that mm -hmm. in that way. Um, and then try. So even if the first the first round doesn't go well, if you're really passionate, mm -hmm. um, try to improve your application. So it's not the end of the world. Um, the process uh, for getting into medicine is brutal. <laughs> Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean that you could never be a doctor if you don't do it the first time, if you don't mm -hmm. get into the first uh, the first time. I was lucky enough that the first time I tried the process, I, I entered mm -hmm. into, but I got one rejection um, mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the, it's not that all universities have, offered, uh, two rejections actually, mm -hmm. it's not that all universities have offered me uh, a place. Um, and um, and the first, the first, um, the first answer I got was a rejection. So mm -hmm. uh, in the application and, um, and at that time I still thought, okay, so that is the first rejection. I was a little bit sad, uh, mm -hmm. but I said, if I get all four rejections out of four, 
I'm still going to try. I still want to give it a go. And mm-hmm. because, um, yeah, it doesn't mean um, that if you don't get the first time, uh, you can never be, you can never be a doctor. Uh, mm-hmm. Prepare, so try to see, uh, try to reason on what went wrong and mm-hmm. uh, maybe getting some feedback. Not many universities can give you feedback. Nottingham does. So mm-hmm. it gives you feedback. If you want other university, they just tell you that you weren't successful and they cannot give feedback. But you can think, you, you realize what, what went wrong. So the university would even give me the offer. I realized what went wrong. So if I, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have, you understand what went wrong mm-hmm. there. So you can, you can work on that and you can, you can bet it. That's not just uh, mm-hmm. um, rest on your laurels and think, okay, so I'm going to try again doing the mm-hmm. same thing. That doesn't work, but don't be, um don't be deceived uh, by the idea that yeah because i didn't get the first time i won't get and then um don't listen too much the negative voices will tell you because you're too old or because you're foreign or because you have a different accent or whatever that you cannot get into medicine um Mm -hmm. um just do your uh, do your research and see mm-hmm. what are the universities that seem more welcoming or more mm-hmm. accepting of students from a more unorthodox background but mm-hmm. don't just listen too much to negative voices not to try because of these and these and that reason mm-hmm. um so just give you a go because i think you regret it more if you don't even try and then if it doesn't work for if it doesn't work it doesn't mm-hmm. work but at least you have um um, you have tried, but being authentic, being, this is what they, they listen to probably, I don't know, 300, 400 people being interviewed. Yeah. They, mm-hmm. this, and, and if they're all this hang, <laughs> uh, they, it's yeah. much less likely that you're going to get into. Mm-hmm. But if it's you coming from that application, if it's you coming from that interview, they can see whether or not you have the potential to be a doctor, but it must be you. Mm-hmm. But sometimes some people, they just deny the identity and authenticity and then mm-hmm. they end up not to get into medicine because they want to follow the trend that they read online or they read somewhere else so that mm-hmm. is my is my first um and being really organized because in in med in the preparation for med school and in medicine mm-hmm. uh, being smart to be an intelligence is as much important as being organized mm-hmm. um so uh, try to find your routine and um, being organized because yeah. that is really important to get on top of the uh, amount of workload mm-hmm. that you you have when you apply to medicine and also when you're ready uh, mm-hmm. uh, for example in gamsat just to have a study routine before you do it mm-hmm. uh prepare just uh, bits by bits break it down so don't you cram in at the very last minute because it doesn't work being well organized and prepared and and try to know that it's hard to do that but mm-hmm. try to enjoy the exam, try to see the perspective, try to see what you're doing it. So you're doing it not for the exam itself, which is quite mm-hmm. brutal, but for what it can uh, give to you, which is mm-hmm. an entrance ticket to Maxine. So mm-hmm. try to, to find the positive side in that way. Yeah, thank you. I think that's all fantastic. I think particularly about the being yourself often, you know, kind of we talked about perceptions of medics. So you said, you know, originally you thought to be a doctor you know you have to be this type of person and you know I think people feel like that's what they have to put forward you know in interviews that they have to be you know amazing at everything and they have to be perfect and straight A student and able to do everything and I think that comes across you know if you're not able to show your real I suppose passions or perhaps your weaker points then it comes across as disingenuous but it doesn't necessarily come from a bad place, but just a place of feeling like you have to live up to this uh, stereotype of what a doctor is perceived to be. Yeah. Um, but I think hopefully by, you know, showing lots of different stories of people <laughs> and showing examples that, you know, although, you know, you are an incredibly impressive individual, you know, you said that you know, surgery is not for you and um, it's okay to, you know, anatomy doesn't come naturally and, doing that that's okay to say um so yeah um just think about your reasons why and think about where your passion comes from and and get that across perfect well thank you so much for your um for your time today um it's been incredible hearing um yeah hearing your background um and good luck going forward for second year and thanks to you for giving me this opportunity Mm -hmm. um Mature medics is a wonderful mm-hmm. idea. 
um, and um, so excellent work that you've been doing and I, I want to contribute to this mm -hmm. something very little to this excellent work you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do it if people uh, didn't give their time. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.